Good morning and welcome to the 36th meeting in 2017 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I please remind everyone to ensure their mobile phones are on silent? Agenda item one is the Forestry and Land Management Bill Scotland Stage 2. And today we are undertaking consideration of that bill. I welcome Fergus Ewing, the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy and Connectivity, and his officials from the Scottish Government. Um, I just wondered at the outset if any members would like to declare an interest. I am going to declare an interest that I'm a member of a farming partnership. It has little to do with this bill, but just wanted to put that on record. Does anyone else want to? Stuart? Um, I have a small register there. Cultural holding. I'm a partner in a farm and partnership as well. I will likewise declare an interest. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Everyone should have with them a copy of the bill as introduced and the second Marshall list of amendments that was published on Thursday and the second grouping of amendment which sets out the amendments in the order of which they will be debated. It may be helpful if I explain the procedure again briefly. There will be one debate on each group of amendments. I will call the member who lodged the first amendment in that group to speak to and move that amendment and speak to all other amendments in the group. I will then call any other members who have lodged amendments in that group. Members who have not lodged amendments in the group but who wish to speak should indicate by catching my attention in the normal way. If he has not already spoken on the group, I would invite the Cabinet Secretary to contribute to the debate just before I move to the winding up speech. The debate on the group will be concluded by me inviting members who have moved the First Amendment in the group to wind up. Following the debate on each group, I will check whether any member who moved the First Amendment in the group wishes to press it to a vote or withdraw. If they press ahead, I will put the question on that amendment. If the member wishes to withdraw their amendment after it has been moved, then they must seek the agreement of the other members to do so. If any member present objects, the committee will immediately move to the vote on the amendment. If any member does not want to move their amendment when called, they should say, not moved. Please note that any other member present may move such an amendment. Sorry, move such an amendment. If no one moves the amendment, I will immediately call the next amendment on the marshalled list. Only committee members are allowed to vote. Voting in any decision is by a show of hands, and it's important for members to keep their hands clearly raised until the clerks have recorded the vote. The committee is required to indicate formally that it is considered and agreed each section and schedule of the bill, so I will put a question on each section at the appropriate point. We do aim to complete stage two today. So moving to the first section, which is the offence of unauthorised felling, I would like to call Amendment 46 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendments 133, 134 and 135. Cabinet Secretary, please move Amendment 46 and speak to all amendments in the group. Yes, I thank you, Convener. Amendment 46 amends the definition of felling in response to the evidence provided to the committee during Stage 1. It moves us to a position where felling, um, for the purposes of this bill, includes both the ordinary meaning of felling and the intentional killing of trees. This is intended to capture both what the sector would recognise as felling but also to ensure that, for example, the <coughs> poisoning or ring barking of trees in order to kill them and move land out of forestry use is also caught. This is in line with the fundamental principle behind the approach to the well-established <coughs> regulation of felling, which looks to control and maintain woodland cover and, if appropriate, apply restocking requirements. And this change is supported by the sector. Um, Mr Chapman's amendments hardwire as a small selection of the current exemptions to the offence of unauthorised felling into the primary legislation. As I've stated previously, I do not think that the place for these convener is on the face of the bill. I see no reason to treat this small selection of current exemptions preferentially, while setting aside those that allow other things. Uh, these include, for example, uh, allowing power lines to be kept clear, exemptions for developments to go ahead that have obtained planning permission, or exemptions for felling required by a water authority. I just give some examples of those that Mr Chapman does not 
feel should be on the face of the bill. They also fail to reproduce those that allow the felling of trees suffering from Dutch elm disease, for example, or purposes associated with aviation, including obstructions to the approaches to and departures from aerodromes. I think members get the sense there's a wide variety of circumstances in which felling may be appropriate or may be necessary, so it's difficult to see why some should be in the face of the bill and some should not. And, and I'm, I'd be interested to see what Mr Chapman says in explanation of his amendment, of course. Additionally, I see nothing from Mr Chapman to cater for changes to be made to the exemptions that he has selected. Uh, they would be fixed. So this is less flexible and proportionate than even the current arrangements whereby much of what is on the face of the Forestry Act 1967 can be changed by regulation, and as you would expect, all of the exemptions made by regulations can also be changed. So there would be introduced a degree of inflexibility, I think, which is not appropriate or desirable and potentially causes unforeseen, unintended, presumably, consequences. So amendments 1, 3, 3, 4 and 5 would create a two-tier system convener of exemptions, I believe, one set in fixed in primary legislation without any route for change were it to be required, and one set in regulations with all of the flexibility that comes with that approach, and which I believe is substantially supported by stakeholders. The bill as introduced poses a much clearer and practical regime where all of the exemptions are created by regulations, uh, and that are found in one clear set of regulations and can suitably be adjusted if there's a good reason to do so. And as a practitioner, I think having one clear set of regulations uh, convener is always a desirable for, uh, for users. Now, I'm absolutely certain Mr Chapman has brought forward these amendments with, with good intentions. Uh, so I hope the issues I've presented today highlight both how far-reaching and how important these exemptions are. And we, we do have to get it right. And I am working with stakeholders to ensure the exemptions we carry forward are fit for purpose and I'm determined we should use this as an opportunity to adjust them if that would be beneficial, rather than simply copying and pasting all of or an arbitrary selection of what is there now. For example, I know that some suggestions have been brought to us exploring whether there is a way to increase the protection of ancient or semi-natural woodlands by adjusting the exemptions based on volume, one of those that Mr Chapman proposes to set in stone. I am committed to considering ideas like this convener in order to have the most appropriate arrangements in place at the point of completing devolution in April 2019. As the committee has already set, heard, I'm using the current exemptions as the basis for what we bring forward in regulations. Changes will only be made where there is a good reason so to do and there will be no gap between the current exemptions and new ones. And I say that because that was a point specifically raised by the committee in its report, that there should be no gap uh, and I think that was a very sound advice and advice that we should follow. And this approach has broad support across the stakeholders that we've heard from. CONFOR do not support these amendments. The regulation power, making power for exemptions is affirmative and Parliament will therefore have the opportunity to scrutinise the results of this collaboration with the sector and other interested parties and I think that's a good thing. I therefore remove Amendment 46. Thank you. I now call on Peter Chapman to speak to Amendment 133 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'm pleased to speak to Amendments 133, 134 and 135. And, and as the Cabinet Secretary uh, intimated, I do bring these forward with good intentions. Um, the, the, these amendments add the key definitions. I, we believe the key definitions and terms from the 1967 Forestry Act and ensure that they are in the new bill. And this is because the bill at present in Section 24 gives the Scottish ministers the power to set out exceptions and regulations. And as the minister has said, he argues that this should remain a general and flexible power uh, rather than setting out specific, specific detailed exceptions on the face of the bill. However, with the 1967 Forestry Act felling regulations repealed in this bill, we argue that specific cases that we want to be exempt should be covered. So the three regulations we have taken from the 1967 Act provide clarity for forestry landowners and these widen the exception to the offence. So that is why I would, uh, I would move the, the th uh, three amendments in my name and I would add that uh, we, I support the uh, Amendment 46 in the Cabinet Secretary's name. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Stuart Stevenson. I just want to speak briefly on uh, 135, uh, which uh, is about the, uh, the cubic 
uh, size of trees that can be felled in three months. Um, and I think putting this into primary legislation illustrates a more general problem. When you remove it from the secondary legislation, put it in primary, you remove the context. So as a lay person, not a forester, I don't know what five cubic metres of wood is. Um, is it, for example, the size of the tree before you fell it? I suspect not, because I can think of a single tree that would be five cubic metres before it's felled. Is it the result of what you get, leaving aside the, the brush that you're going to discard? In other words, what does it mean? And when you bring it into primary legislation without any explanation of that sort of thing, I think you create some dangers, at least for the layperson. It may not be the case, by the way, and I accept this, uh, for the professional forester. That, that, that's maybe the case. Uh, but it, it just in reading it as a layperson, it struck me that uh, it kind of stood alone from a context which it probably would have in the secondary legislation. Okay. Cabinet Secretary, I invite you to wind up, please. Um, well, I do recognise Mr Chapman has brought forward his amendments with, with good intentions, and I just wanted to repeat that and thank him for so doing and allowing a debate on an important matter. But I do believe that... Uh, a, we do need to have the clarity that will come from having the regulations determined in secondary legislation and the flexibility that comes from that. The amendments in Mr Chapman's name would deny that flexibility, which could be required in the future, and whilst apparently demoting the importance of exemptions in other areas, many of which I've covered, but many others I have not covered. So, um, so I think this is largely a technical matter uh, where all the, stakeholders, uh, 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 all the stakeholders appear to agree with the government's approach, and I would therefore commend it to the committee. Okay, thank you. So we, uh, the question is that Amendment 46 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. So I move on to the next section, which is remedial notice, and I call Amendment 47 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with other amendments as are shown in the grouping. Cabinet Secretary, to move Amendment 47 and to speak to the other amendments in the group, please. Uh, this group of amendments, while very large, encompasses three areas, two brought forward by the Government and one by Mr Chapman, all relating to the remedial notices provided for in Part 4 of the Bill. Remedial notices will be used where it appears to the Scottish Ministers that a person is failing to comply with a permission, direction or registered notice. A remedial notice will set out what steps must be taken by a person in order to bring them back into compliance and, although the hope is this will result in compliance, if it does not, Ministers may then use their step-in powers. Uh, so for the sake of giving context to this long and technical group of amendments, the sequence for felling permissions is this. A permission is granted for felling with conditions attached, usually relating to restocking of the site. One or more of those conditions is not complied with. Thirdly, ministers serve the person who is failing to comply with the remedial notice, setting out steps that they must take in order to come back into a compliance, and this could be about the timing that within which restocking is to be done or the way in which it's to be done, for example. Uh, and next, if the steps are not taken, ministers may use their step-in powers and carry out the steps themselves. And finally, if ministers consider it's reasonable to do so, they may reclaim the costs of taking those steps. I thought it useful to run through the process where the remedial notice would come into operation. They are a crucial part of the enforcement picture and they, they allow for the end that we all want to see reached compliance with conditions. In other words, conditions set out for restocking should be complied with and this process allows us to have confidence that uh, there is a mechanism so to do. They do not, however, interfere with the ability to refer any offences to the procurator fiscal. That op option is open to ministers at any point in the process. The first of my proposed changes is to make it clear that remedial notices may have conditions placed upon them. This is dealt with by Amendment 85 and those made in consequence of 85, namely 81, 84, 86, 89, 97 and 100. This brings remedial notices into line with felling and restocking directions and will ensure that Scottish ministers are able to specify in regulations what those conditions can include. On registering remedial notices, the second of my proposed changes is to bring remedial notices in line with permissions and directions as far as the ability to register is concerned. Amendments 87, 88 and 101 together do this by enabling registration, 
Secondly, by underpinning registered remedial notices with an offence of fa failure to comply. And third and lastly, providing for appeals to be made against refusal to vary or discharge the notice. Amendments 47, 48, 52, 55, 57 to 80, 82, 83, 90 to 92, 98, 99, 114 are made in consequence of amendments 87, 88 and 101. This is important in order to ensure that remedial notices can be enforced in the same way the other permissions directions are in the bill. Turning to Mr Chapman's um, a, amendments, which are about reasonable or reasonable conditions, is amendments 75A, 78A, 81A, 84A, 85 and 86A, 87A, 89A, 97A and 100A, all seek to insert the word reasonable to all of the government amendments that inserted references to conditions on remedial notices. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to reassure the committee that ministers are bound, in fact, to act reasonably in exercising all of their powers. Uh, why this is stimulating jocularity is a matter for members. Uh, so we are bound to act reasonably. We are bound by the law to act reasonably in exercising all of our powers, including all of the powers set out in this bill. The imposition of remedial notices and the inclusion of conditions is a discretionary power. All discretionary powers which ministers have must be exercised according, in accordance with the rules of administrative law. This means that the powers must be exercised in a manner which is reasonable and proportionate and for proper purposes. In Scotland, the Court of Session has judicial oversight Decisions may be challenged through the process of judicial review, and that has happened not infrequently, and reasonableness is at the very heart of that. If a power is exercised in a manner, to paraphrase Lord Green in the, wed in the case known as Wednesbury, uh, that is so unreasonable that no reasonable authority could ever have come to that decision, then the courts may interfere and hold that decision to be out with the scope of the power conferred by Parliament. I'm very pleased that uh, in those decisions that I've taken over the years, and I can think of four which I will not name, uh, the courts have uh, eventually decided that I did act reasonably in all circumstances. <laughs> uh, that irrelevant personal observation aside, um, I can... <laughs> Cabinet Secretary, I'll let you continue. <laughs> uh, it, it, it is an illustration that this, these matters are taken quite seriously, very seriously, and I can assume Mr Chapman has lodged these amendments with the laudable aim of protecting the regulated from unreasonable actions by their regulator, and I believe that the addition of the word reasonable would, instead of providing clarity or reassurance, have the potential <coughs> to cause some confusion. <coughs> After all, if one presides in some circumstances that ministers must act reasonably, then it does beg the question that where ministers have other discretionary powers, and the word reasonable does not if, uh, appear, uh, then is there a difference? And it begs the question about whether or not there is some different degree of duty uh, or uh, imposed upon ministers. So the potential for confusion is there, albeit that I'm absolutely certain Mr Chapman's amen amendment is well intentioned. So for those reasons, I would invite him respectfully not to press his amendments. Thank you. Peter Chapman, please could you speak to Amendment 75A and other amendments in the group? Yep, okay, convenient. I will speak to 75A, 84A, 85A, 86A, 87A, 97A and 100A uh, in my name. Um, and, and although we do support the addition of registered remedial notices, we do not agree with the wording that ministers can issue registered remedial notices. And this is a key bit, including any condition imposed on it. That's what it says. We think it should, should read, including any reasonable condition imposed on it. We just feel that's too wide. Um, so that this, it, adding the additional word reasonable before the condition means that they have to relate to forestry and be applicable to the bill. So adding reasonable to the conditions imposed on registered remedial notices makes for fair and proportionate conditions, I would argue. And as the, as the, the Cabinet Secretary said, a, the, the government is bound to act in a reasonable manner, so therefore I would take it from that that he should have no objection to the word reasonable appearing uh, in the bill uh, under the various sections that I have outlined. So um, with that in mind, I would uh, the move these amendments in my name. You'll move them later. All right, sorry. 
Yeah, sorry. Okay, thank you. I'm finished. Uh, Stuart. Thank you very much, convener. Um, there's always a temptation to sort of take a blanket approach to these things, and unfortunately it leads you into uh, temptations which you should avoid. And I particularly want to look at uh, Amendment 84A, where the addition of the word reasonable um, has the opposite effect to that which Mr Chapman uh, suggests. He says that uh, the power is too wide, we need the word reasonable. However, if we look at uh, what uh, the, the bill before us says, that before amendment by the Minister, by the Cabinet Secretary's um, uh, amendment, it reads, the Scottish ministers may vary or remote, revoke a remedial notice. When you add uh, the Cabinet Secretary's amendment to it, it, it uh, becomes, uh, the Scottish ministers may vary or remote, revoke a remedial notice, including any condition imposed on it, when you add the word reasonable, it becomes the Scottish ministers may vary or remote, revoke a remedial notice and any reasonable condition imposed on it. In other words, we deny the Scottish ministers the opportunity to revoke uh, a condition that was not reasonable. So, in fact, the addition of the word reasonable restricts the power to uh, uh, revoke a remedial notice and is an example of how the word reasonable, one might may to make a logical uh, case for including it, you have to go back to the legislation and look at the effect of every individual word that you add. And in the case of 84A in particular, and I only focus on that one just to exemplify uh, the dangers of what uh, Mr Chapman is proposing, it actually has the opposite effect, which the one which I think he seeks and, and would not be one uh, that I could possibly support because it restricts the ability to revoke remedial notices which might be concluded by Mr Chapman or others not to be reasonable. Um, Mike Rumbles. Thank you. Yeah, for a moment I thought I was on the set of a that comedy production, Yes Minister, when does the word reasonable actually mean unreasonable? <laughs> and I'm astonished to hear um, members so far, the Minister and, and Stuart Stevenson, making a marvellous case to make the word reasonable sound unreasonable. Um, I don't accept the proposition. Um, to me, um, I'm going to support, if they are moved, um, Peter's, uh, Peter Chapman's <coughs> uh, amendments, which are full of reasonableness. I, I can't think of uh, any better amendments, actually, that we've seen in this uh, whole process, that they are full of reasonableness, and it does restrict um, the minister's actions and it puts it into law. I heard the minister say that ministers are required by law to act reasonably, and of course they are. But let's not forget this is the law. <laughs> we are actually making the law, and we're putting it into black and white so for the avoidance of doubt. I think um, to have to go to court to see whether ministers are acting reasonably or that they haven't acted unreasonably, uh, is, would, would, no, no, I think you've had your say, um, Stuart. Um, uh, I, th I think, I think um, I'm, I'm commenting on the Minister's comments. I think um, it is strange to have to think that we'd have to go to court to prove the Ministers were not acting unreasonably. Whereas if it's actually in the bill and it becomes an act of Parliament where there is a requirement in black and white for the issue of these notices for the Minister to act reasonably, I, I, I go back to where I started from. I was actually thinking maybe I am on the set of, of yes, Minister, when I, when I hear the, word, the English language being turned on its head. Full of reasonableness, I'm a reasonable person, and I certainly will support these reasonable amendments. Okay. Uh, Mr Finney, John. Thank you, Convener. Well, like uh, Mr Rumbles, I quite often think I'm on the set of yes, Minister, when I hear Mr Rumbles speak. Um, I... Uh, I'm also a member of the Justice Committee. We transact a lot of business. It uh, makes uh, certain demands on ministers. And I, I have to say, it would be endless amendments if we were to insert this word. I think we heard from Stuart Stevens a very graphic and very practical reason why we shouldn't support these, and I won't be supporting these amendments. Thank you. Uh, Richard. Well, I, I know Mr Rumbles is always a reasonable man, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, he just destroyed his own case. Uh, and basically, the concern I would have is this, that a lawyer would have a field day with that word. 
So therefore, I won't be supporting Mr. Neither Mr. Chapman or the reasonable Mr. Rumbles. Um, just before I hand it back to the Cabinet Secretary, if I may make an observation, if a remedial notice is issued under this law, which has to be reasonable, with reasonable conditions, there is no way that you would want to remove any conditions that weren't reasonable because they wouldn't have been put there in the first place. So reasonable, is, it, to me, is a very good argument for it, and, and therefore I should, I should be supporting it. But I, I, I think we'll go back to the Cabinet Secretary and let the Cabinet Secretary wind up. Uh, well, I'll just make three points that, that um, were Mr Chapman's amendments be accepted, then we, we would, in this statute, be adopting an approach which is entirely inconsistent with the approach that we have taken in this Parliament and, indeed, that is taken in the history of parliamentary draftsmanship and is unnecessary because of the uh, extant law across the UK based on the Wensbury test. So it's unnecessary and it creates confusion. I've said that already. But there are actually, even within this draft bill, un unintended consequences because Mr Chapman's imposition of reasonable would apply to some matters but not to others. For example, if you look at section 31, this confers upon ministers powers in relation to felling directions. Uh, if it appears that the felling of trees is required, then it confers quite wide powers upon ministers. And the regulations may include, for example, in section 316D, the imposition of conditions on a felling direction. Now, had Mr Rumbles seriously intended that his approach be consistent, then the word reasonable should have appeared in front of the word conditions, because he would argue that we could act in impliedly unreasonably in relation to felling directions. So that creates this inconsistency even within this bill that we would be bound to act reasonably, specifically, explicitly in some cases to do with remedial notices, but not in relation to other cases even within this bill, which surely is inconsistent and not something that, that uh, any reasonably minded member would be liable to support. And the last point I make is this, that because of the way that Mr Chapman has worded his amendments, there is actually, I presume, a further unintended consequence, which is that we would still be able to impose remedial notices which were unreasonable, we just wouldn't be able to register them. In other words, it, we wouldn't be able to register unreasonable conditions, but we could impose them. Well, that's the result, or would be the result, if Mr Chapman's amendment is approved, and I would submit that that would be... Um, certainly unreasonable and perhaps even more perverse. Thank you. Uh, therefore, we'll move now to the question is, and the question is, Amendment 47, are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question, therefore, is that Section 22 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay, I'm going to call Amendment 133 in the name of Peter Chapman, already debated with Amendment 46. Peter Chapman, to move or not to move? Uh, not to move. OK. Not, does any other member present object to the amendment? It hasn't moved it. So uh, sorry. Yep, confused. Sorry. Too early in the morning. Moving on to Amendment 134 in the name of Peter Chapman, already debated with Amendment 46. Peter Chapman, move or not move? Not move. OK, thank you. The question, therefore, is to call Amendment 135 in the name of Peter Chapman, already debated with Amendment 46. Peter Chapman, move or not move? Not move. OK. Therefore, call Amendment 48 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary, to move formally, please. Moved. The question is, are we, is that Amendment 48 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question now is that Section 23 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question, therefore, is are Section 24 and 26 be agreed? Uh, sorry, 24 to 26 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And so move on to the next section, which is the continuation of, of conditions on felling permissions. Can I call Amendment 49 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendment 50? Cabinet Secretary, to move Amendment 49 and speak to both amendments in the group. I'm grateful for the consideration the committee gave the provisions in the bill relating to registration. I hope our discussion on 13th of September served to clarify the intention behind the powers to register notices, specifically that this is about making sure that conditions ministers place as the forestry regulator on a piece of land will bind future owners. This is entirely focused on ensuring that conditions 
or, as the case may be, directions can be enforced regardless of how many changes in ownership there have been and will mean conditions come up in the solicitor's ordinary searches, uh, property searches, when a piece of land is undergoing purchase. Conditions are familiar to the forestry sector uh, and routinely set out restocking requirements and timeframes. They may also set out, for example, how to ensure that operations respect buffer areas around certain rivers while salmon are spawning, or stipulate that no opera operations may occur near Capercaillie core areas during the breeding season. They could also include longer term conditions, such as the management of important open space within a forest area to stop unwanted encroachment by natural regeneration of invasive species such as rhododendron. As suggested, I've considered how best to ensure that the proportionate and cost and resource effective use of powers to register notices. The risk-based approach to registration, since it's a power and not an obligation to register in all instances, was alluded to in stage one and has now been given further thought. I consider that taking a risk-based approach to registration is the best way to use the power in order to ensure compliance with conditions, such as restocking conditions on a felling permission. Um, owners will in future require to advise uh, the local conservancy of plans uh, to put their forest property on the market. That will enable a trigger uh, to allow the conservancy, the new forestry division operating locally, to consider whether there are conditions that require to be registered. Amendment 49 seeks to put beyond any doubt that conditions can, on top of all the familiar conditions that I've already mentioned, require information to be provided to ministers from those using felling permissions. The type of information that we envisage being required is, for example, that a sale of land is being prepared so that ministers can take a risk-based approach to registering conditions. Amendment 50 makes clear that the regulations will, that will be made to provide further information on how decisions will be made on felling permissions may include detail on how these requests for information will operate. Taken together, I believe that these amendments support the proportionate use of the power to register that the committee rightly asked for, uh, and I'm pleased that CONFOR and Scottish Land and Estates, who did have some reservations about registration initially, agree that this is the correct approach. I move Amendment 49. Thank you. Um, no other member wants to speak. Uh, so, Cabinet Secretary, I'm assuming you will forego your winding up uh, at that stage, and I can move directly to question uh, that is Amendment 49 be agreed. Are we agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Uh, and we now move to Amendment 50 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 49. Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you to move it formally, please? Moved. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 50 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question now is that section 27 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question, further question is that section 28 and 29 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Right, we now move on to the next section, which is the felling of trees subject to tree preservation orders. Can I call amendment 51 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary group with amendments 53 and 54? Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you to move Amendment 51 and speak to all the amendments in the group, please? Tree preservation orders, or TPOs as they're known, are used by planning authorities to protect trees in their area in the interests of amenity or because they're of culture, cultural or historical significance. They can impose prohibitions on cutting down and lopping trees, for example, so it's possible there will be an overlap with the forestry felling regime. However, currently this overlap does not often occur. Usually, those cases where TPOs are in place relate to trees which are currently subject to exemptions for felling. Gardens, orchards and churchyards are currently exempt, as is the felling of small volumes of timber. As I have already outlined, we are working with the sector to review these exemptions and, where appropriate, refine them, but we do expect the overlap uh, convener to remain limited. However, to ensure that a person who wants to fell in an area where both regimes apply does not need to apply for permission twice, Amendment 51 provides the Scottish Ministers with the ability to refer an application to fell to the planning authority that made the TPO. If Ministers decide to determine the application instead, 
Amendment 51 preserves the requirement to consult the planning authority that made the TPO and to take account of their representations. It also disapplies the offence of felling without permission for actions taken in accordance with the TPO consent after such a referral. And this is in line with current practice. Amendment 54 requires ministers to consult a planning authority before issuing a felling direction if the direction relates to a tree which is a subject to a TPO. This brings the felling direction provisions in line with the felling permission provisions. Amendment 53 is consequential to Amendment 54. Convener, I move Amendment 51. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, no other member has asked to speak, so we will move directly to the question. And the question is that Amendment 51 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. So I'd like to call Amendment 52 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary, can you move it formally, please? Moved. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 52 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Uh, therefore, going to call Amendment 53, again in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 51. Cabinet Secretary, can you formally move it? Moved. The question now is that Amendment 53 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. There is one further question on this, and that is that question section on... Sorry. The question is that section 30 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I'm now going to call Amendment 54 in the name of... Cap the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 51. Cabinet Secretary, can you move it formally, please? Moved. The question is that Amendment 54 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question, therefore, now is that qu Section 31 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Section 32 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. So I'm now going to call Amendment 55 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary, can you move it formally, please? Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 55 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Section 33 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Section 34 to 36 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. We now move on to the section of on the definition of the owner. Can I call Amendment 56 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendments 109 and 113? Cabinet Secretary, please can you move Amendment 50 speak, 56 and speak to all the amendments in the group? Amendment 109 defines what is meant by owner for the purposes of the Bill. Amendment 113 is consequential to 109. We are seeking to define owner for the purposes of the Bill in order to put beyond doubt that when ownership has transferred by a means that does not trigger a change to the title sheet of the land register, we mean to refer to the most recent owner. Um, when ownership transfers on inheritance, say, uh, convener, this is an example, it is often carried out by docket transfer with no change to the title. The purpose of Amendment 56 is to replace each owner with the owner. In Section 37, regarding registration of notices of variation, the owner is used throughout the rest of the bill, and the effect of this amendment is to bring section 37 into line with other sections in the bill. I move amendment 56. Thank you. Uh, another member wishes to speak, therefore we will move straight to the question, and the question is that amendment 56 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I'm now going to call amendments 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63 and 64, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated with Amendment 47. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendments 57 to 64 on block. Move on block. Does any member object to the question on each amendment, sorry, to putting a single question on each of the Amendments 57 to 64? No. No. The question, therefore, is that Amendments 57 to 64 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Section 37 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I'm now going to call Amendments 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70 and 71, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated with Amendment 47. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendments 65 to 71 on block. On block. 
Does any member object to a single question being put to amendments 65 to 71? No. The question, therefore, is that amendments 65 to 71 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that section 38 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I'm now going to call amendments 72 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary, could you formally move it, please? Formally moved. The question now is that Amendment 71 be, uh, sorry, 72 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Section 39 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I'm now going to call Amendment 73 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already de debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary, can you formally move it? Please? Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 73 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Section 40 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I'm now going to call Amendment 74 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary, can you formally move it? Please? Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 74 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Section 41 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I'm now going to call Amendment 75 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary, can you formally move it, please? Formally moved. OK. I'm now calling Amendment 75 in the name of Peter Chapman. Sorry? 75A. 75A. Sorry, thank you for the correction. Call Amendment 75A in the name of Peter Chapman, already debated with Amendment 47. Peter Chapman, move or not move? Move. OK. The question is that Amendment 75 be our agreed, 75A be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not a, a, a agreed. Therefore, I call a division. Those in favour of the amendment, please raise their hands. Those against... Okay. The votes for the amendment is four. The votes against are seven. The amendment is not agreed. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to press or withdraw Amendment 75? The question... Pressed. Sorry, thank you. The question is that Amendment 75 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call the Amendment 76 in the name of cabinet the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary, will you formally move it, please? Moved. The question is that Amendment 76 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 77 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary, will you formally move it, please? Moved. The question is that Amendment 77 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Section 42 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Section 43 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I now call Amendment 78 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary, can you formally move it, please? Formally moved. I call Amendment 78A in the name of Peter Chapman, already debated with Amendment 47. Peter Chapman, to move or not move? Not move. Not moved. The question... Yeah. The, the question is uh, that... Am amendment 78 be agreed. Yeah, sorry. The question is that Amendment 78 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 79 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary, will you formally move? Formally it? moved. Sorry, the question therefore is that Amendment 79 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Section 44 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I now call Amendment 80 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary, to move formally, please. Moves. The question is that Amendment 80 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Section 45 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Section 46 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Sorry, I'm going to take a slight pause for a drink of water. <laughs> You sound more and more surprised. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm now going to call Amendment 81 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary, can you move it formally, please? 
formally moved. I now call Amendment 81A in the name of Peter Chapman, already debated with Amendment 47. Peter Chapman, move or not move? Not move. Okay. The, the, the question, therefore, is that Amendment 81 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I'm now going to call Amendment 82 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary, can you move it formally, please? Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 82 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 83 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary, to move formally, please. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 83 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Section 47 be agreed. Are we agree all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I'm now going to call Amendment 84 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary, can you move it formally, please? Formally moved. I call Amendment 84A in the name of Peter Chapman, already debated with Amendment 47. Peter Chapman, to move or not move? Not move. Okay, therefore the question is that Amendment 84 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I'm calling Amendment 85 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary, can you move it formally, please? Formally moved. I call Amendment 85A in the name of Peter Chapman, already debated with Amendment 47. Peter Chapman, to move or not move? Not move. Okay. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 85 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Section 48 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 86 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary, can you formally move it, please? Formally moved. I call Amendment 86A in the name of Peter Chapman, already debated with Amendment 47. Peter Chapman, to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 86 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Section 49 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I'm now going to call Amendment 87 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary, can you move it formally, please? Move. I call Amendment, therefore, 87A in the name of Peter Chapman, already debated with Amendment 47. Peter Chapman, to move or not move? Not move. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 87 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 88 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary, can you move it formally, please? Formally moved. The question that Amendment 88 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question now is that Section 50 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 89 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary, can you move it formally, please? Formally moved. I now call Amendment 89A in the name of Peter Chapman, already debated with Amendment 47. Peter Chapman, to move or not move? Not move. OK, the question, therefore, is that, quest that Amendment 89 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I'm now going to call Amendments 90, 91 and 92, all in the name of Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated with Amendment 47. I m invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendments 90 to 92 on block. On block. Does any member object to a single question being put to Amendments 90 to 92? No. The question is, therefore, is that Amendments 92 to 90, sorry, 90 to 92 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Section 51 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We now move on to the next section, powers of entry and step-in power. Can I call Amendment 93 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendments 94, 95 and 96? Cabinet Secretary, can you move the Amendment 93 and speak to all amendments in the group? Amendment 93 adds summary sheriffs to the list of persons who can issue warrants under Section 52 of the Bill to authorise entry to land where entry has been refused or is reasonably expected to be refused, the land is unoccupied or the owner is temporarily absent. This means the full list of those who can issue warrants for the purposes of this section would be sheriffs, summary sheriffs and justices of the peace. It is government policy to include summary sheriffs in the provisions for the granting of warrants like section 54. Amendment 94 is consequential to Amendment 93. Amendment 96 has the effect that references to the Scottish ministers in sections relating to site visits, powers of entry and step-in powers include persons authorised by the Scottish ministers. This means that 
ministers will be able to use contractors or consultants as the need arises, for example, to carry out site visits to check compliance with conditions relating to a protected site. Amendment 95 is consequential to 96. I move Amendment 93. No other member wishes to speak. Therefore, I'm going to move straight to the question that Amendment 93 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I'm calling Amendment 94 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 93. Cabinet Secretary, can you formally move it, please? Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 94 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Section 52 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question now, therefore, is that Section 53 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I'm now going to call Amendment 95 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 93. Cabinet Secretary, can you formally move it, please? Um, formally moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 95 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 96 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 93? Cabinet Secretary, can you formally move it? Please? Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 96 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Section 54 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I'm now going to call Amendment 97 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary, can you formally move it, please? Formally moved. I therefore call Amendment 97A in the name of Peter Chapman, already debated with Amendment 47. Peter Chapman, to move or not move? Not move. OK, therefore, the question is that Amendment 97 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 98 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary, can you move it formally, please? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 98 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Section 55 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Section 56 to 58 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I now call Amendment 99 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary, can you formally move it, please? Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 99 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Section 59 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I'm now calling Amendment 100 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary, can you formally move it, please? Uh, it's formally moved. I call Amendment 100A in the name of Peter Chapman, already debated with Amendment 47. Peter Chapman, to move or not move? Not moved. OK, the question, therefore, is that Amendment 100 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. I therefore call Amendment 101 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 47. Cabinet Secretary, can you formally move it? Moved. Thank you. The question is that um, Amendment 101 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question, therefore, is Section 60 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We now move on to the next section, which is Information, Research and Education. I call Amendment 13 in the name of Peter Chapman in a group of its own. Peter Chapman, can you formally move the amendment and speak to it, please? Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, this amendment, uh, I think, is quite important. Important, in my opinion, it is, anyway. That it's a, it changes the word may to must. And this is in, re, in, re, in, in re, reference to section 61 which is about information research and education and this means that ministers must carry out research and now when speaking with many stakeholders we all agreed everyone agreed that there can never be a time when we don't need more research in regards to tree health uh, and uh, education etc I, I believe there, there is never a time when this is not needed so therefore I move that the uh, amendment 13 in my name. Stuart. The effect of changing may to must is extremely slight. Um, were it to say must, the Scottish ministers only need to do it once. That's the effect. So that, and we know that research of the kind described is being undertaken. So therefore, uh, just in practical sense, um, in, it, it would only need to be done once. It has no effect. OK, Cabinet Secretary, do you have any comment on that? Research, development and education are extremely important functions in relation to forestry. 
and the Scottish Government, of course, is committed to carrying out uh, these functions as appropriate. I can inform members that in 2016-17, through the Scottish Government, through the Forestry Commission Scotland, commissioned nearly £1 million of Scottish-specific research and development. I've got full details here, but I just wanted to start off with that clear commitment. Um, whilst I appreciate what Mr Chapman is trying to achieve with Amendment uh, 13, I would like to offer an alternative approach, which I believe is to be preferred. And I'm also concerned that the amendment as it stands would oblige Scottish ministers to carry out functions even when they're not necessary. I acknowledge that this may seem unlikely when it comes to research into tree health. We, we are sadly unlikely to run out of avenues for research on that front in any of our lifetimes. But the amendment goes much further than research and covers all of the matters listed convener in section 61 to which uh, members may wish to refer. Um, these are all of the matters which are necessarily drafted quite broadly as they were intended to be enabling in nature. But this amendment would oblige ministers to do uh, all of the following, to carry out research and inquiries, to collect data and publish statistics, to provide education and training, and to encourage or assist other persons to do any of those in the exercise of the bill's functions. And further, it would apply to all of the minister's functions under the bill. So the amendment goes much wider than, for example, a duty to carry out research into tree health or to provide training for machine operators working in forestry, which I believe may be the intent behind the amendment. Indeed, such research and training is vital and is currently carried out without such an obligation being in place. The Forestry Act does not place this kind of duty on the forestry commissioners, but rather enables them to carry out such work. As the duty would apply to all ministers' functions under the bill, it would include functions related to the management of non-forested land or the regulatory functions that we have discussed in the previous groups today. Even in relation to the forestry parts of the bill, convener, it's unclear what the amendment actually would mean. For example, consider an obligation to provide education and training in connection with the duty to prepare a forestry strategy, a duty that rests on Scottish ministers, currently on me. Now, maybe Mr Chapman believes that I need to be educated or trained prior to undertaking the duty that is or would be imposed upon me in order to prepare the forestry strategy. That actually is what his amendment means at the moment, and I presume that is not something that he had in mind when he lodged the amendment. Um, ministers may well consider appropriate that the strategy includes material on education and training in the forestry sector, but that's not the same thing as a duty to provide education and training in connection with the duty to prepare the strategy. Um, a second example of the difficulties is that it personally obliges ministers to assist others. Uh, and this would again have consequences that I presume were unintended. For example, the private sector have an obligation to collect data and publish statistics. And this would impose an obligation on ministers uh, to provide assistance in that respect, which might have the effect of imposing obligations on taxpayers to cover expenses which properly would be due by private sector businesses. Again, I don't think that that is something that Mr Chapman intended to be the case, but because of the way his amendment uh, is framed and because of the wording of Section 61, that is a, a consequence of what it would mean. Uh, nonetheless, I can understand the motivation behind the amendment, and I have sympathy with anyone attempting to provide sure footing for important issues, and I am committed uh, to ensuring that tree health research continues at levels that we need. Indeed, on the day of the Stage 1 debate, we announced that forest research would continue as an agency of the Forestry Commissioners, and I am, in fact, visiting the forest research station at the Bush Estate tomorrow. Um, in conclusion, I, just, I would prefer to work with Mr Chapman between now and Stage 3 to develop a duty that focuses on having suitable arrangements in place to carry out tree health research. Uh, I believe an amendment that focuses on maintaining or improving our capacity would be a, a proportionate way forward. And, and uh, finally, I point out that ministers have agreed across the UK an equitable split of the £11 million core budget for cross-border functions, uh, which is currently held in the DEFRA vote. And the majority of this funding does convener relate to research. 
uh, a, which would thus be carried out in accordance with the existing strategy known as Science and Innovation for Forestry in Great Britain. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Now, a member is asked to come in, and I'm going to let him come in, Jamie Green. And if any other member wants to come in, having heard that before I ask Peter Chapman to wind up, please let me know. Yes, Jamie. Uh, I <clears throat> thank the convener for allowing me to uh, participate after listening to the Cabinet Secretary with great interest. Uh, just a few uh, points on this. I think uh, I, there is a technicality issue here which the Minister has identified around the changing of the word may to must in the sense that does this place a duty on the Minister as an individual to conduct the research and educate or does it, does it, uh, would, it would changing the word may to must uh, create a duty on the minister to ensure that research takes place as opposed to the minister him or herself conducting the research or inquiries or publishing the data etc as listed in points A to D. That's a, perhaps a point of clarification uh, that I'm unsure of. Um, I do support in essence what Mr Chapman is trying to achieve and it's up to Mr Chapman whether he proceeds or not with the amendment but I think uh, given the ev much of the evidence that we took in the sessions uh, on this bill uh, was that there was concern and genuine concern from uh, different factions as, uh, as to the, the restructuring of the Forest Commission Scotland uh, becoming a, uh, in essence, a government department, that it was vital that we protect some of the key functions of the Commission, such as uh, publishing data, education, training, research, etc. So I, I, I do welcome the Cabinet Secretary's proposal to, to strengthen. The, the problem with the word may is that it also means that the, cabinet, uh, the uh, Scottish Minister may not. And I think what Mr Chapman is trying to achieve is more, uh, is to strengthen the section to ensure that those current functions of the Forest Commission are not lost in any way as a result of this bill or any restructuring that takes place, which is uh, why I, I was uh, keen to, to support Mr Chapman. Cabinet Secretary, uh, there was a question in there which I will give you a chance to answer, but I'm going to go to Mike Rumbles first. So, uh, Mike. Thanks, Kevin. I just wanted to say, I, I mean, Section 61 is an enabling section, and it seems quite reasonable to me that the Minister is being required to, is being enabled to do all of this. So I'm perfectly happy with the word may rather than an instruction must. But I just wanted to comment on what Stuart Stevenson said. I mean, he said that if you put the word must in there, you only have to do it once. But actually, if you leave, leave the word may in there, it doesn't have to do it at all. Mm. Uh, and that's the point. But I trust the minister and I trust other ministers um, to operate under this enabling legislation. I don't always trust everything ministers do, but I do in this particular case. And so I'm happy um, not to support the amendment. Cabinet Secretary, would you like to make a comment on the question that Jamie Green raised? Um, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch it. I wonder if Mr Green could, for my benefit, just reframe the question. Please, Jamie. Happy to. <clears throat> I, I, it was prob probably more an observation, Cabinet Secretary, but it was around your point and, and your statement that uh, changing the word may to must meant that the duties were on the minister as an individual as opposed to the minister and his departments. I think the, the objection to using the word must is that the obligation would then be to carry out research whether or not it was required. I mean, there is no question we require research. In fact, we must have research because of the threats to tree health by plant disease, uh, hybolium and so on. Um, this is one of the biggest worries to forestry, as all members will know, and as I'm sure you heard uh, from all stakeholders. So there's no question about that. And uh, Therefore, our concern was that um, the obligation would exist that we had to carry out research, but not, but you know, of any sort, whether or not it's required. Um, as a matter of practice, if I could just reassure members that you know this will essentially be a function that's carried out at UK level. We have reached an agreement with the UK government and the Welsh administration about how that's done. We have reached an, an agreement about how the a budget should be allocated. We've reached an agreement that the various administrations will take leads in specific areas. We've reached an agreement that the Welsh Government will take the lead in relation to research. And we've reached an agreement that, of course, the research that's carried out will be determined by all of the 
uh, bodies, the UK government, the devolved administrations, uh, and it will be done in accordance with the existing strategy, which uh, is called um, Science and Innovation for Forestry in GB. So there already is quite a settled approach to this, and, and there's lots of excellent staff in Scotland that are working on this. Um, but obviously, we, uh, of course, I'm happy to do that. Taking an intervention on that point. Uh, I, I'm certainly reassured by the talk of the collaborative work within uh, the GB. Can you confirm that part of the, the liaison regarding research will be on an international basis as well, please? Uh, of course, uh, uh, scientists have regard to all evidence from, from wherever it is based, and it's important, to, of course, for scientists to look at the work of, of others uh, across Europe and, and beyond, and uh, they do. Uh, and. Uh, uh, you know, I think that's an uh, important point Mr Finney has raised. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And I now call on Peter Chapman uh, to wind up and to press or withdraw the amendment. Thank you, Convener. Um, I, I do ab absolutely believe that may isn't a, isn't a strong enough word in there, and I, I don't understand what uh, Stuart Stevens was saying about if, if you put in must, then you only must do it once. I, I, that doesn't seem to be logical in any way, shape or form. But I do recognise in 61D, for instance, the Cabinet Secretary <coughs> pointed out that my amendment would, would mean that I, we must encourage and must assist other persons, maybe private persons, <laughs> to do some of the things. And I, I accept that that wasn't what I had uh, intended uh, with my amendment. Um, so I do welcome the, the offer to work with me. I, I do think we need to, to strengthen this, this word may, but if the Cabinet Secretary is minded to work to achieve a, a, a fairer or a better a meaning in here, then I am prepared to, to accept that offer and uh, withdraw on that basis. Okay, thank you. So I have to ask a question that does any other member present object to the amendment being withdrawn? As we don't object, no one objects, we'll move on to the next amendment. Uh, sorry, no, I've got two questions first. The question is that section 61 be agreed. Are we all agreed? The question is that section 62 to 64 be agreed. Are we all agreed? So I move on to the next section, which is organisational structures. And I'm going to call amendment 102 in the name of Ray de Grant, group with amendments 103, 104, 105, 107, 108 and 136. Can I ask Ray de Grant to move amendment 102 and speak to all amendments in the group? Um, can I move amendment 102 and speak to the others in the group? When we took evidence on the bill, there was concern that the new structures would mean a loss of forestry expertise that was so well regarded in the Forestry Commission. The government have ignored pleas to change the structures. Therefore, these amendments are attempting to protect forestry expertise and keep the new organisation rooted in the industry and the communities they serve. Amendment 102 creates the post of a chief forester. This has been modelled on, on the statutory provision that requires local authorities to have certain professional heads of service, for example, chief finance officer, chief education officer and chief social work officer. It establishes a requirement for a post but leaves ministers to specify in regulations what the mandatory professional qualifications are for anyone to get this post. 107 makes those regulations subject to neg negative procedure. 103 is very similar to 102 but creates a post of area forester. This amendment does not prescribe the area but leaves that to Scottish ministers. My understanding is that there are five divisions currently in that and these could be designated as areas to be covered by area foresters. Again, it allows Scottish ministers to bring forward regulations for the qualifications or experience that would be required by the post holder. Again, Amendment 105 makes these regulations subject to negative procedure. Amendment 104 puts in place a na national advisory group. This would not be a formal commission, um, but a, a group that ministers can appoint to advise them. Again, this is designed to keep forestry rooted in the economic, environment and social principles that should guide our forestry policy. Amendment 105 sets up, a similar, sets up similar local groups again in areas that could fo follow current forestry divisions. I hope these amendments will keep the best of what the industry and communities cherish of the Forestry Commission, keep the management of the forestry 
of forestry close to its stakeholders by giving stakeholders a real say in policy making. Turning to Amendment 136 in the name of Claudia Beamish, I think one of the most Con well, most contentious parts of um, this bill is actually the bit of the bill that's not in it. And I support uh, Claudia's amendment in that those government structures could be published and scrutinised in order <coughs> to give some comfort to those in the industry. Thank you. I'm now going to call uh, Claudia Beamish to speak to Amendment 136 and the other amendments in the group. Thank you very much, Convener, and good morning to members and, of course, to the Cabinet Secretary and, and those with him today. Um, I'm, I speak in support of my own Amendment 136, um, of which there has been um, a considerable amount of dialogue between my own office and other offices um, with um, some stakeholders um, uh, in the lead-up to, to, to this meeting. Um, and in its stage one report, um, your committee, the REC committee, um, as I understand it, recommended that Scottish ministers should set out details of how they will manage and administer their forestry responsibilities, and that members should also consult on and notify Parliament of any significant future change in these arrangements. The committee also noted that stakeholders had expressed wide-ranging concerns about the separation of the functions of the Forestry Commission. I would like to very briefly quote the consultation um, responses on the bill. Um, question 1A says, our proposals are for a dedicated Forestry Commission in the Scottish Government and an executive agency to manage the National Forest Estate. Do you agree with this approach? And um, there, there were around, um, it, I'm, I'm simply quoting from this document, around five in, uh, 20 respondents, I'm not quite sure how it could be around, but anyway, I'm, I'm quoting, um, agree with the proposal by 13 in 20 disagree, and around 2 in 20 did not answer the question. Um, and amongst the um, organisational responses, um, the three most frequently made points by those disagreeing with the proposals uh, were that the management of Scottish fo uh, Scotland's forests, um, and I again quote, should be or remain independent and be the responsibility of a standalone organisation which is separate from government, and secondly, should be managed by forestry experts and professionals rather than by civil servants, and thirdly, should sit within a single organisation and not be divided between two, two different bodies. So this amendment does seek to reflect um, that both the um, committee recommendations as I, as I have understood them and address the concerns um, expressed by some stakeholders, um, including the Forestry Commission Scotland Staff Union, um, by requiring ministers to lay before Parliament a report setting out the administrative arrangements they intend to make for the carrying out of their functions under this Act. This would include the arrangements um, intended for the establishment of an ag any agency, its governance, the different roles and responsibilities of senior <laughs> officers, the financial accountability, establishment of advisory groups, and the exercising of the power to form companies, etc., under Section 62. It, it also requires ministers to consult on any future significant amendments where pro appro with appropriate persons and to notify the Scottish Parliament. And as I've highlighted, a number of forestry stakeholders have raised concerns about the new arrangements, explaining to me their belief that, the forest, that Scotland's forest should sit within the single um, organisation. And, and as I've highlighted in the bill consultation, this was raised. At this stage, I have not lodged an amendment to directly address this issue, um, in part because it's not my committee, um, and, and I... Show, I'm trying to show respect to the committee, but also due to legislative advice I've received about um, the complexities of this, and my not wishing to lodge an amendment that could in any way be construed as a wrecking amendment. But the stakeholders are concerned about the bill's pr proposals, which could sacrifice the long-established brand identity, culture of joining, working, and knowledge share, joint working and knowledge sharing, and the practical attitude of the current organisational arrangements. It would be welcome if the Cabinet Secretary were able to address these concerns as he will himself be aware they were raised at the consultation stage. And my Amendment 36 is an attempt to address these concer concerns constructively. And while I, I live in hope that the Cabinet Secretary might consider accepting it, I do appreciate that um, um, it's quite a, a tall ask at, this, at stage two. 
but I, I would be very keen, um, perhaps more appropriately, if the Cabinet Secretary were con to consider discussions before Stage 3 on the issue of a single organisation with those continuing to express these concerns. And although I don't have a vote, I also support Rhoda Grant's amendments because I think that they will enable uh, a more, again, a more um, outward-looking um, arrangement uh, through the amendments she suggested, especially having a chief forester to oversee things. So thank you very much, convener, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Claudia. The first person who's asked to speak is Jamie Green. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Rory Grant and uh, Claudia Beamish for bringing before these amendments. Uh, I would like to speak to the amendments in this group, uh, starting with uh, Amendment uh, 102, uh, around the creation of a Chief Forester. I believe this reflects uh, a view that was taken in the committee report at Stage 1 uh, around the appointment of a Chief Forester. This is a necessary uh, function and it's a welcome addition to the Bill. I'm therefore happy to support uh, Rhoda Grant's Amendment 102. Uh, however, uh, Amendments uh, 103, 104 and 105 uh, I do have concerns over. Um, uh, the, by putting in primary legislation that we must appoint area foresters, uh, in my view this is a step too far in creating additional and perhaps unnecessary bureaucracy in the organisational structures of the future agency. Um, I believe that the Division of Scotland into administrative areas perhaps is unnecessary for the purpose of forestry when looking at a national outlook and strategy. I believe that decisions should be taken by the Chief Forester, which is why I'm happy to support the uh, Amendment 102, which would create such a role. And uh, also, I think that by putting uh, these uh, area uh, foresters into primary legislation, uh, we are setting in law a structure which may not necessarily meet the needs of future governance of forestry. Uh, uh, in a similar tone, Amendments 104 and 105, with the creation of a national advisory group and local, local partnership groups, I've got absolutely no doubt that Rhoda Grant has uh, uh, very well intentions uh, behind these amendments. Uh, however, again, I feel it adds unnecessary um, bureaucracy to proceedings and uh, do not, uh, in, 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 in any case, there could be unnecessary uh, unintended consequences in the sense that decisions made by future uh, governments may be hindered or disrupted by having too many layers and levels in this decision-making process. That being said, I'm happy to uh, uh, support Amendment 107, uh, which reverts regulatory powers uh, to the Chief Forester. I think that reflects a support of Amendment 102 in the creation of that role. Uh, then, uh, logically, uh, places regulatory responsibilities on that new role uh, if it were to go ahead. Uh, however, uh, uh, cannot support 108 uh, because it links back to the creation of the area foresters, which I do not support. Uh, I hope that all is uh, helpful. If I may move on finally uh, to speak uh, around Amendment 136, um, Claudia Beamish's amendment. This is, a, in my view, a welcome addition to the bill. Um, I think it addresses many of the concerns that we heard over the course of proceedings, and I pay particular attention to Amendment 136, Section 3B. Um, I believe that it increases uh, accountability and scrutiny uh, on, on the part of the Parliament to the uh, next steps of the government as it takes this quite bold step of uh, integrating the Forest Commission functions into its own departments. Um, I also believe uh, that it includes welcome additions around uh, some of the concerns that we heard from witnesses around loss of expertise, restructuring, and also the financial reporting and accountability of that department uh, as listed in, in Section 3B of the amendment. Uh, therefore, very happy to uh, support that amendment if it were to go ahead. Uh, in any case, uh, I also think the Cabinet Secretary uh, would be mindful to take heed of the general comments made by Claudia Beamish, uh, around the intention behind the addition of this amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, John. Thank you, Convener. Um, well, I, I speak in support of my colleagues Rhoda Grant and, and Claudia Beamish uh, amendments. In particular, uh, taking them one by one, 104, what we did here was a lot of um, affection for the Forestry Commission as it as exists and, and presently structured. But we also have concerns, and these have been rehearsed uh, about the potential 
absorption into Scottish Government and the, the loss of forestry expertise and professionalism. So I, I see uh, Amendment 102 has been entirely in line, uh, and not just with what was said in Stage 1 report, but, but also, and Rhoda alluded to local authority um, positions. We also have um, Scottish Government ones of Chief Medical Officer, Chief Scientist, Chief Planner. It's entirely consistent with that. In relation to 103, um, surprise no one that is agreeing we want things to be local up. And rather than the, 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 the exclusive focus on the central functions, I think it's very important that there's a, a clear responsibility laid out for the area. So take issue with uh, Jamie Green's position on that, that this, that this isn't needed. It will always be needed. There is no point in having central functions unless you have um, something to, to oversee. Yes, absolutely. Thank you uh, to Ms Finney for taking the mention. I, 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 I do share the, the, uh, the view that, that um, local decisions can, can and should be made. I, I do wonder, though, if it should be the responsibility of the Chief Forester to make decisions as to how he organises his team structurally rather than impose it upon him in, in primary legislation. That's my only concern around the creation of these area foresters. Well, I think whoever he or she may be that would assume that post of um, them, um, I, th I think it's important that Parliament gives a very clear steer that it's local decision making that's important too, that that can be informed by a more strategic approach. Um, and following on from that, the National Advisors Group, I, I, I would hope the Scottish Government would lend support to that. And that's entirely consistent with positions they've taken in relation to other ma matters. And in this committee, we've heard of the, 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 the rural advisors, for instance. Um, I, I will be supporting 105. I have some concerns uh, about um, subsection 1, sub paragraph B, about the establishment. Um, and, and I hope that that could creatively be looked at because, of course, there are a number of fora that exist at local level that could uh, fulfil um, some, if not uh, the vast majority of these functions. But <coughs> I, I, again, entirely in line with the, the design we're looking for, we want collaborative local working. Um, and uh, I won't say much more on um, Claudia Beamish's uh, amendment other than to say I, I fully support it and the, the direction it would take us in. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Uh, Stuart. Thank you, uh, convener. Um, just picking on the words again, um, the 102 says Scottish ministers must, for the purposes of assisting and advising them, etc. Um, so that's assistance. I'm not quite sure what assistance means. Advice, maybe. Um, but assistance, I'm not quite sure. Uh, the National Advisory Group in 104 uh, doesn't use the word assist, but is there to advise. Um, the 105 assists and advises uh, local partnership group. Now, the, the, leaving aside the immense uh, burden of this hugely complex oversight that appears to be desired, just a personal view, um, what happens when the advice from these different levels uh, is in conflict with each other? Um, you know, when you've got, you've got a mandatory requirement that advice uh, comes in and assists, um, the, 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 the proposals, if we were to accept them in total, uh, can uh, Yes, the member will. I'm grateful, the member, accepting intervention. But would you not accept that that's day to day politics? That, of course, ministers are um, compelled to make decisions on the basis of often competing advice. And, uh, that's situation normal. Oh, no, of course. And, and, of course, ministers in discharging the responsibilities under this Act, and indeed many other Acts, uh, would wish uh, to consult and receive advice uh, because anyone that helps ministers do the best job they can do is, is to be welcomed. I'm just very unclear um, that, uh, that why we should create a structure where the National Advisory Group in particular can be seen to undercut and cut across the functions of a, a chief forester. And I, th I think that's just legislatively not a comfortable place to be. And local partnership groups, uh, um, it, it, similarly, um, you're, you're talking about being in conflict with national advisory groups. And I just don't think that's particularly helpful. I would have thought, if you're going to create uh, structures like this, that yes, there should be empowerment of local decision making, as there is at the moment, and as there would be even if we don't pass any of this. Um, I just think the construct is difficult. I'm not necessarily tackling wider principled issues, which uh, we'll hear from the Minister on. I just think the construction where we're to pass all of this in total 
um, would be a recipe for some unhelpful potential conflicts. And I also don't know what the word assist means. Thank you, uh, Stuart. Mike Rumbles, followed by Peter Chapman. I'm always astonished um, by my colleague Stuart Stevenson's um, contributions. I'm, I'm astonished he doesn't know what the word assisting means. Um, to me, it's perfectly obvious what assisting and advising ministers is all about. But there we are. Um, I'm also astonished to be in complete agreement with my colleague John Finney. Uh, and he he, 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 he um, is obviously astonished by that. Um, but I'm absolutely with him 100% in everything he has said um, on this issue. I think it's really important. I think these amendments do reflect what um, the evidence that we received at stage one and elements reflect the report that we produced at stage one. And I would be hopeful that the minister will accept these amendments. Now, I, I, I do understand, and I haven't, we haven't heard the minister's response yet, but I do understand that ministers can find in any opposition amendment almost any reason any particular reason, any focus on a particular word, to reject an amendment. Uh, it could cause, cause, cause confusion, it could cause difficulties, uh, and persuade members to, to vote against them. Um, I would, uh, as I say, and I haven't, haven't, I haven't heard the minister, I could be completely surprised, the minister could say, well, these are really good amendments and we accept them, but I actually would prefer that we would see these amendments all of them, from 102, 103, 104, 105, 107, 108, and 136, on the face of the bill. And if the minister feels that they could be improved upon at stage three, to come back at stage three and do that, I would rather see them on the bill at this stage, because I do actually think it reflects the evidence we've received, the committee report that we've produced, and I think probably a majority of, we don't know yet, but a majority of members of the committee. And I would rather hope that the, we'll see them on the face of the bill. And if the minister feels he needs tweaking, or, then he can bring forward amendments which we could all support at stage three. Thank you, Mr. Rumbles. Uh, Peter Chapman. Thanks, Convener. Uh, it would appear there's lots of astonishment around this table today. It uh, would appear, and, and to some extent I reflect that, because I'm quite astonished that I'm agreeing with a lot of what Stuart Stevenson has said today. I'm not so astonished that I'm agreeing with, with my colleague Jamie Green, because uh, that would be to be expected almost. But I do agree that uh, the one or two, the, the uh, Chief Forester did receive, the, the position of a Chief Forester did receive wide support as we took evidence uh, as a committee. Many of our stakeholders uh, agreed that that was a, a, an important post to, to put in place. So I do agree with 102, but 103, 104, 105, I, I don't agree with. I think it's too bureaucratic, too cumbersome, too adds another level of complication, and uh, too many layers can actually stop things happening. So I, I don't agree with, with them. Uh, 107 is okay, because that refers back to Chief Forster. 108, no again. And uh, as far as Claudia Beamish's uh, amendment is concerned, I do welcome that. I think it's a fair addition to the bill. Uh, I think it, there is much support for, for that uh, out, out there, in particular with the, the, the union. Uh, people certainly are keen to see something along these lines uh, included in the bill. So I do support Claudia Beamish in her uh, amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Well, thank you, Convener. First of all, I would thank both Rhoda Grant and Claudia Beamish for moving the amendments, but also I think for the way in which they've removed them and for the whole tone of the debate. And perhaps I could just make and start off very clear in response, I think, to Mr. Rumble's invitation and make, a, uh, a make it, because I've got quite a lot to say, some of which is intended for consumption of people who work uh, for the Forestry Commission or Forest Enterprise around Scotland, and which I want to place on record to provide reassurances to them, Convener, which may take some time. But for the sake of clarity, uh, I want to make a clear undertaking to members that, uh, that uh, I will continue, as we've done prior to stage, uh, stage two, uh, work very closely with all members prior to stage three with a view to going as far as we possibly can to meet the desires of members, and in particular to bringing some of these matters onto the face of the bill if we can. And I wanted to start off with that undertaken given uh, in this non-scripted part of my remarks because I very much want to continue the way we've been working thus far uh, and I think we can make progress on many aspects uh, and therefore I just wanted to start off by making that clear. Um, I, I 
do fully recognise the importance of ensuring that people who have the right professional skills, knowledge and experience are engaged in the development and delivery of forestry in Scotland. And let me make absolutely clear to the concern about centralisation, which exists, and, and I visited all the conservancies over the summer, and I, I did hear about this from, from some individuals, obviously. Uh, we will not be bringing in people from the local offices to work in the centre. We value people who work in the conservancies. They do work locally, they work locally, and that work is essential. Uh, and it's essential that they continue to do that work. And meeting them in person allowed me to see how important that was. Uh, and therefore, I'm grateful for the opportunity to state that on the record today. Um, and also, I want to go further. I mean, I want to expand on the existing skills development mechanisms within the Forestry Commission Scotland and Forestry Enterprise Scotland, and to continue to involve foresters and other professionals in the discharge of the Scottish Government's forestry uh, function. And the, the uh, structure that we propose, the establishment of a dedicated division and uh, the retention of an agency, calling it Forest and Land Scotland, both of which will be part of the Scottish Government. Kavita, this is close, as, is close to a lift and shift of the current arrangements as possible. We are transferring the functions of forestry commissioners to Scottish ministers and transferring the existing staff to undertake these functions. So the new structures, decisions on which I announced in May, do preserve, they don't disrupt or separate, they preserve the distinction between the two entities, the Forestry Commission Scotland and Forest Enterprise Scotland. Uh, so we retain two entities. And I think some, of, some criticism, I'm not suggesting today, but some criticism has been based on a false premise that there is in fact one entity at the moment. There is not, there are two, and there will continue to be two. Uh, a, retaining the separation between the two parts maintains and other things, as I think Simon Hodge said in Evans Convener, the valuable financial flexibilities that FES currently enjoys. For example, the ability to carry over funding from one year to another would be lost were there not the retention of, FE, of FES in the agency format a, a, a convener. And that was a significant, important practical factor. Now, throughout this process, the day-to-day -day forestry functions and operations should be disrupted as little as possible. And therefore, I want to restate for the record to those with an interest that there will be no compulsory redundancies in FES or FCS as a result of devolution. That local offices will remain as a vital source of regional knowledge, skills and delivery. Uh, and that forestry decisions will continue to be taken by forestry experts. And I wanted specifically to give these undertakings in the record today. And they're very sincerely given and uh, freely given undertakings, convener, because they're the right things to do. And staff will remain as civil servants on transfer to the Scottish Government. So, put simply, the same experts will be delivering the same functions as they do now at a national level and locally. Uh, a forestry devolution programme board involving senior staff from the Scottish Government and Forestry Commission has been established to plan for and manage the transition. And as part of that work, I'm grateful for the, the positive leadership role uh, that uh, both Simon Hodge, Chief Executive of the FES, and Joe O'Hara, the Head of Forestry Commission Scotland, are showing in leading on implementation of the new agency and new division projects. So, you know, a lot of work is going on, has been going on, and will continue to be done behind the scenes, and rightly so. These projects are based on skills retention, including identifying ways to continue to recognise and value engagement with professional bodies, and identifying jobs that require specific professional qualifications, such as in forestry. Uh, staff interchange between the division and agency, both of which will be part of the Scottish Government, will continue to be encouraged, as it is now between FCS and FES. Now, um, and this is important, and I think it deals substantially with uh, Claudia Beamish's Amendment 136. At stage one, I committed to providing a statement providing further details on how ministers will manage and administer their forest resp forestry responsibilities and the relationship between the dedicated forestry division and forestry and land Scotland. And I want to confirm today, convener, that uh, I will make this statement available before stage three. And I want to do that so members have this statement that will cover these matters prior to stage three. And when I say prior to stage three, obviously leaving sufficient time for amendments to consider the statement in order to, to decide whether or not further amendments would be required as part of the stage three debate. 
Uh, so I'm, I've decided to bring forward this and make this statement prior to stage three. And again, I wanted to make that clear uh, today. Now, I note the, the approach, this approach was supported by the committee at stage one and by stakeholders in their stage two briefings. CONFOR, for example, states that the details of a chief forester post of the Division of Forestry and Land Scotland would be better set out in a statement alongside uh, the bill. And I'll come back to that because it's a very important uh, amendment. Um, on Rhoda Grant's amendments 102 and 107, uh, I, I am giving active consideration to having a chief forester's role as a way of recognising the importance of specialist forestry expertise. Um, I have been taking soundings from stakeholders, uh, and although there is widespread support for the idea of a chief forester or a similar role, what there doesn't seem to be, convener, is a common view on the role or its title. And it does seem to me that further work requires to be done on what the role or purpose of that post would be. Some people envisage it as a regulatory function. Other people envisage it as relation to skills and education and ensuring the importance of that being delivered. In other words, different people have different concepts and ideas about what such a role would maintain. But I, I undertake today to Rhoda Grant in urging her not to press her amendments today that I am sympathetic to her proposal. I undertake to give it further consideration and I also undertake to have further discussions with members that wish to engage in those discussions on the committee uh, and with uh, others who take an interest who are not in the committee, such as Claudia Beamish, prior to stage three. Um, as, a, as for amendments 103 and 108 on area foresters, I'm not quite clear on their effect. We have um, fi five conservancies at the moment. We have five conservators, and the word conservator actually is a very important role. It, uh, I think, gives a sense of the calling of the ethos of those who work in the Forestry Commission. It's a uh, an achievement to become a conservator is a great personal achievement, and those who become conservators are themselves uh, professional foresters who are proud of their calling. So I'm not quite clear what is meant by area foresters as opposed to conservators and how that would fit in. I'm just not quite clear, although I, I know that the amendments are well intentioned. Um, I've already made a commitment that the local office network will remain and that forestry decisions will continue to be made by forestry experts. Uh, uh, I wanted to make a further comment about the proposal in section 102 to have a chief forester. Um, I've had an opportunity, convener, to examine uh, how similar roles have been established in government, and I think this is an important point. Um, this has revealed, this research has revealed that the roles set out in statute are limited to the non-ministerial office holders as determined by the Scotland Act 1998, as determined by that, if you like, founding statute of devolution. And these are Chief Medical Officer, Keeper of the Registers of Scotland, other chief roles such as the Chief Planner or the Chief Economist, in other words, the type of role that I think we are speaking about here today, uh, are not set out in statute. And I think we also do need to be careful and be mindful of the reserved, <coughs> devolved issues because the civil service is a reserved matter. So uh, we need to be mindful of that in framing legislation. But there are two types of chiefs at the moment, statutory chiefs and non-statutory chiefs. Uh, and we have to be careful about how we proceed here. But I think that we can find a way forward working together where the objectives that people who have... Uh, inform this debate, uh, stakeholders uh, can uh, realise what they wish with a bit of further thought, a bit of further work. I would also respectfully point out to Rhoda Grant that other than the reference to assisting and advising, there is in section in Amendment 102 no clear definition of what the role is. In fact, uh, it does allow Scottish ministers to prescribe uh, qualifications. So if you like, it does confer a back, back, uh, back uh, room power on ministers to, if you like, uh, have a substantial role, which perhaps may not be in the thinking of many of those who want a chief forester, perhaps to have a degree of independence from ministers. Uh, I'm not sure, but that is one further matter that needs to be explored, and I'm happy to take uh, an intervention from Mr. Green. 
I do thank the Cabinet Secretary for uh, taking my intervention. I, I think uh, on that point, isn't there a slight contradiction in, in what he's, he's saying in the respect that the fact that this amendment does not prescribe what that role is or does, does give the Minister some flexibility to work with uh, protagonists to in, in develop the role, but all this does is, and it's in a very important amendment, is ensure that that role is created per se, which is something I think there is widespread support for. Well, I, th I think the way it's, I can understand Mr. Green's point, but I do respectfully suggest, convener, that the way in which uh, 102 is amended um, would mean that the Chief Forester would not be independent of Scottish Ministers, and perhaps many of those who advocate there being a Chief Forester would, would, would do so precisely because they would like the Chief Forester to be independent of Scottish Ministers. I just make that point. But it's certainly the case that the role is not particularly well defined other than assisting and advising uh, in terms of, sec of Section 102. But I go back and just re-emphasise that I'm, I'm sympathetic to this uh, proposal and believe that further work would result in us being able to overcome working together some of these technical objections, which is why I, I hope that uh, Ms Grant and Ms Beamish won't the amendments today. I do have some more comments to make, um, however, because of the wide range of the topics covered by the amendments. Um, I absolutely wholeheartedly endorse the need for close engagement with stakeholders across all aspects of forestry. This is, this is essential, uh, and I hope that I've illustrated that by the work that we've done since the last Scottish election that we, we do regularly engage with stakeholders at a national and local level. Um, both on specific issues such as the reference group set up to advise and delivery of Jim McKinnon's recommendations and more general matters such as forestry summits that I've hosted or regional groups that provide local advice and input to the work of Forestry Commission Scotland and Forest Enterprise. So effective engagement is essential and I will give further thought and again I undertake to do this on whether there is scope for incorporating uh, uh, some, commit some commitment to this effect on the face of the bill. I'm not yet convinced that that is the best way forward because any government will wish to ensure that there is local and national engagement with stakeholders and I think that's something of which this, the Scottish Government cannot really be accused of failing to do as a whole. But nonetheless, I'm happy again to give the undertaking that we will give further consideration to these. And the reason I do so is because I am aware that there are some, some issues uh, that people still have. Um, on Amendment 136, this uh, from, from Claudia Beamish, and I hope my commitment to provide the statement in advance of stage three of the organisational arrangements to help ministers deliver their forestry functions will persuade her that this amendment should not be pressed at this point. And I, and I say that as someone who has engaged uh, substantially with, for example, workforce representatives whom I met, I think, in the substance with uh, at least three meetings over the last uh, a year or so and will continue to do so. And there is another important reason why I can't support of course, and through the convener. Uh, um, yes. I uh, could ask the <coughs> Cabinet Secretary if um, he could clarify what the status of the statement will be, if it's not um, understandably on the face yeah, of the bill, because it, it, it may need adaption in the future. But could, could he clarify for um, myself and others what that status Mr. would be? Well, I, 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 I mean, I, it's partly a legal question. That's why I hesitated slightly, but it would be hmm. a statement of ministerial intent and, and similar in respect to, uh, to that of any ministerial statement. Um, but it, it's intended to clarify uh, the questions that I think underlie the amendments that uh, Claudia Beamish has put forward. Um, the, so I, I hope that, uh, that that is helpful to her and it will certainly cover many of the, of the areas which uh, uh, she seeks assurances on in terms of her amendment. And there's another reason why I, I can't support the amendment, that um, constraining ministers' powers to commence legislation, convener, that Parliament has already approved, does strike at the core element of any act. And I'm not aware of any precedent where there is such a provision in any bill that prevents the bill, once enacted, from becoming law. Once Parliament decides to pass a law, that is its decision. So um, 
uh, I should say I'm informed it's extremely rare in statute. I think I may have said it, it hasn't occurred at all. I, I'm not aware of any such example, but uh, just correct that for the record. So it's essential for the effective operation of the legislative process that ministers have the control over when they bring provisions into force. And while the amendment only refers to two sections, in effect, we could not practically commence large parts of the Act. For example, we couldn't, convene a, we couldn't commence Part 4 without laying the report. Otherwise, there would be two felling authorisation processes in place. And that would subvert the very advice that the committee gave, that they wanted there to be no gap in respect of the felling provisions. So, you know, I think that's a technical point uh, which needs to be considered in any event. We could be looking at delayed timescales for implementation and increased uncertainty for the sector and staff, and I'm sure this is not what anyone would wish to achieve. Um, so, in con a drawing to a close, convener, the approach I've been suggesting throughout stage two is one which I think illustrates the effectiveness of the parliamentary process where we're not seeking to score points, but working together to get the best outcome. I have given, I hope, clear undertakings today uh, signifying that the matters raised are, are substantial and important ones, ones where I respect the views of the members and I undertake not only to make a statement but also to work specifically on the content and substance of, uh, of uh, these uh, amendments during the period from now to stage three, uh, uh, in particular in relation to having a post of the Chief Forester, something to which I'm sympathetic, but also in relation to the other matters uh, which we've discussed today. And I hope, given that I apologise, somewhat long uh, contribution convener today, that members will accept on face value as genuine and sincere uh, the undertakings that I've given to uh, work with members over the coming weeks. And on that basis, I would urge those members not to press at the moment those uh, amendments. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Red Grant, could I ask you to wind up and press or withdraw your amendment, please? Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you, convener, and I appreciate members' comments because I think that was really helpful. I mean, these amendments were really designed to try and keep forestry very rooted in the industry and in the communities that it serves. So uh, there were many, and I appreciate that there were layers that maybe are a bit off-putting to some people, but those layers were designed to try and keep not only forestry at a national level well within the industry, but also at a local level. But I appreciate what people are saying about some of the layers that are in there. They may be too complex, but I would hope that we, I could take the, the Cabinet Secretary up on his offer to look at maybe um, putting in legislation items of the conservators and the like, something that would keep um, that local. Um, can I just say to Stuart Stevenson, who had issues with the word assist, I realised very quickly he wasn't assisting me with his comments, so um, <laughs> if that helps to explain it a little better to him, I, I, I hope he'll take that in the spirit it was meant. Um, coming, I suppose, to the first and I think most important of the amendments is that of the Chief Forester. I think it was very clear in the evidence we got um, that this role was wanted by the industry and indeed by communities. And the reason that the definition is very vague is to allow that consultation to go ahead so that that, that role can be something that is meaningful and supported by the whole industry and the communities. So I think it would be important today to put that down on the bill as a marker. The, the definition can be changed in, at stage three to make it more, more fitting to people's views and aspirations. But I think it would be important to put it down today as a marker and then maybe consult on the other, part, the other amendments in the group to see if they could be shaped in a way that would assist that post and keep it locally placed. So... <coughs> Can I just confirm, Reddy, you want to press Amendment 102? I want to press Amendment 102. Okay. So the question, therefore, is Amendment 102 be agreed? Are we all agreed? No. Yes. yes. We are not agreed. There is division. Can I ask all those in favour of Amendment 102 to raise their hands, please? Can I ask all those against 102 to raise their hands, please? Okay, 
I confirm that there are six votes in favour of Amendment 102 and five against. Therefore, 102 is agreed. Can I call Amendment 103 in the name of Rader Grant, already debated with Amendment 102, Rader Grant to move or not move? OK, I'll call Amendment 104 in the name of Rader Grant, already debated with Amendment 102, to move or not move, Rader? Not move. OK, to call Amendment 105 in the name of Rader Grant, already debated with Amendment 102, Rader Grant to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. The question, therefore, is... Uh, no. Yeah. It's called, I would therefore call Amendment 106 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment... 47. Cabinet Secretary, can you formally move it? Please? Formally moved. The question is Amendment 106 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 107 in the name of Rader Grant, already debated with Amendment 102, Rader Grant to move or not move? Move. Move. Therefore, can I ask it, the question is that Amendment 107 be agreed? Are we all agreed? No. Yes. yes. Right, that we're not agreed, there's a division. Can I ask those, all those in favour of it please to raise their hands? All those against to raise their hands, please. Okay, there are six votes in favour, five goes against, so the amendment is agreed. Can I call Amendment 108 in the name of Rader Grant? Uh, already debated with Amendment 102. Rader Grant to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. The question, therefore, is that Section 65 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. We are agreed. The question is that 66, Section 66 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 109 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 56? Cabinet Secretary, can you formally move it, please? Uh, formally moved. The question, therefore, is Amendment 109 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that section 67 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The question is that section 68, schedules 1 and 2, and section 69 to 71 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call amendment 110 in the name of Richard Lyle, already debated with amendment 23? Richard Lyle, to move or not move? Move. The question, therefore, is amem Amendment 110 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call amendments 111, 112, 113 and 114, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated? I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move amendments 111 to 114 on block. Moved on block. The question I have is, does any member object to a single question being put to amendments 111 to 114? No. The question, therefore, are our amendments 111 to 114 agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that Schedule 3 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Sections 72 and 73 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. And now I call Amendment 136 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 102. 102. Claudia Beamish, to move or not move? Uh, Convener, I don't intend to move today, but I would like to make a brief comment if that's acceptable. A very brief comment, yeah. Right, thank you. Um, I, I, I do note what the Cabinet Secretary has said. I also note the comments from Jamie Green, John Finney, Mike Rumbles and Peter Chapman and Rhoda Grant, which are on the record. And I, I think it's extremely important that um, this discussion proceeds because there does, frankly, appear to be some confusion in the minds of stakeholders or elsewhere because um, the, the Cabinet Secretary has highlighted, and correct me, please, Cabinet Secretary, with intervention if that's appropriate, that, that, um, that I, I think you said it would be a lift and shift as much as possible with, with the arrangements for the agencies as they are now when they're transferred to be devolved. But that is not what the perception anyway, I use that word with care, has been of some of those stakeholders who've discussed with myself and others um, what will happen. So I, I think I, I really do have a concern about this. I note the statement possibility before stage three, which I would um, really urge the Cabinet Secretary to make sure comes in good time, but there are still serious concerns, and I will intend to bring back um, a, a, an amendment at stage three or discuss with uh, a member of the, the 
committee bringing back an amendment at stage three uh, in terms of a unified forestry agency um, or indeed the, um, the, the, a, a better developed version of my amendment 136 at stage three if we, if we can't make progress, which I hope as an optimist we will be able to with the cabinet secretary. Okay, I'm, I'm not proposing to open this up to further debate because we have already debated it and the cabinet secretary has given an undertaking and, uh, and I've noted the comments that Claudia has made. I mean, I am taking from that you do not wish to move uh, the motion. No, I don't wish to move. Okay, okay so the, the, the motion has been, uh, the amendment has been moved. So I have to ask the question is that amendment 136 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Oh. Yes. We're not agreed, so there's a division. Can I ask uh, those in favour of uh, this amendment to raise their hands, please? Can I ask those against to raise their hands, please? Okay, the votes for this amendment is five. The votes against are six. Therefore, it is not agreed. The question, the question that I now have to ask is that section 74 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The question is that se section 75 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Now I'd like to call Amendment 115 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 18 on day one. Cabinet Secretary, will you formally move? Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 115 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The next question is that the long title be agreed. Are we agreed? Yes. That ends the stage two consideration of the bill. Can I say that members should note that the bill will now be reprinted as amended and this will be available online and in, and in hard copy at 8.30am tomorrow morning. The Parliament has not yet determined when Stage 3 will take place, but members can now lodge Stage 3 amendments at any time with the legislation team. <laughs> members will be informed of the deadline for amendments once it has been de de determined. Thank you, everyone, and that concludes today's bu committee's business, and I now close the meeting.